All right, so now we're going to move on to historical overview. So we're going to talk a bit about the origins of Islam um, and especially about the, the sort of social and cultural context, what was going on uh, at the time that Islam starts as a religious tradition. Um, so the first thing that I have here, and sorry, these PowerPoints, um, I'll, I'll try to fix it before the next one. It doesn't have the, the descending one. They just all show up at the same time. Um, but we'll go through each one of these points here. Um, so uh, Islam starts with an individual named Muhammad. Um, and Muhammad's dates are here. So he lives from 570 to 632 CE. Um, so we are moving ahead about uh, 550 years after the death of Jesus, right? So we're, we're jumping forward in time. Um, and we're also moving to uh, a slightly different location in the world. Um, Muhammad is born and lives in a town called Mecca, uh, which is in the present day country of Saudi Arabia. Um, and at the time was just sort of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, so something to know about that culture, about the Arabian Peninsula at the time, um, is that there is a lot of religious diversity there. Uh, so in Mecca, there are Jews, there are Christians, um, and there are tribal religions or polytheistic religions. So it's also a tribal culture. Um, everyone within that culture is a member of a tribe. Um, and a tribe is sort of a large extended family network. Um, so uh, within Mecca and outside of Mecca, um, you know, there's a lot of these tribes. Um, <clears throat> and outside of Mecca, the tribes are nomadic. Um, so they wander around the desert, they move around the desert. Um, and usually a tribe would have, you know, their individual god or a couple of gods. Um, so there are these independent sort of polytheistic tribal religious traditions. Um, so there's, there's all of that going on within this culture. Um, and sort of some, some more background uh, about that. Um, Muhammad himself, so Muhammad himself, uh, he considers himself a monotheist. So he's not a Jew, he's not a Christian, um, and he doesn't subscribe to sort of the polytheistic religious traditions of the day. Um, but he is a monotheist. He believes that there is one God. Um, and something that he had a, a habit of doing was once a year he would actually go out into the desert. Um, he would go to a cave and he would sort of take some time, take a couple days, um, sort of a spiritual retreat, a personal spiritual retreat. He would go out there, be in nature, um, and just take that time to pray and to meditate and to sort of refocus. Um, sort of similar to, you know, someone today going, you know, going camping by themselves, you know, going away for, by themselves for a weekend um, to just kind of have a, a personal spiritual retreat, some time on their own. Um, so Muhammad, um, Muhammad is from, uh, he's from a certain tribe, so he's also a member of a tribe. Uh, and his tribe is called the Quresh tribe. Um, sometimes it's spelled K-U-R-E-S-H, sometimes it's spelled Q-U-Y-R-A-S-H, um, but it's the Quresh tribe. Um, and his tribe, uh, actually there are some members that are pretty wealthy and pretty powerful, um, but he's not, he's not part of the sort of wealthy and powerful um, contingent within his tribe. Um, he's actually orphaned at a very young age. Uh, he's raised by a family member. Um, he's, uh, he's not very well educated. Uh, he's not, doesn't have a lot of money. So he has pretty humble beginnings, humble origin. Um, so this is, uh, this is sort of the, the cultural context of the beginnings of Islam. So what happens when Muhammad is 40 years old, um, so he, he actually, he gets married, he has a wife, his, her name is Khadija. Um, Khadija's a little bit older than Muhammad. Um, she's a business owner, she owns a trading company, um, and Muhammad works for her, and that's how they met. Um, so when he's 40 years old, he's married, he's working for his wife's company, uh, and he's going on these spiritual retreats. He's going up to the mountain um, once a year to sort of have this time to recenter, refocus. Um, and when he's 40 years old, he goes on this, this usual yearly retreat, and he's up in this cave. The cave is called Mount Hira. Um, and he has this experience. He has this overwhelming spiritual, mystical encounter. Um, he, a, a being, um, what, what he later figures out is an angelic being appears to him uh, and tells him to recite. 
uh, says you know Muhammad to to recite, and he's he's absolutely baffled and overwhelmed and terrified by this experience. Uh, so he he runs down off the mountain. He goes home. Um, he tells his wife what happened, and he's you know he's really upset. He's really shaken by this experience. Um, and his wife says, you know, well this this sounds like maybe it's a religious matter. It's a spiritual matter. Uh, and she says, you know, I, I don't know that much about these things, but I have a cousin who's a Christian. Um, and, you know, so maybe he'll know about this. Maybe we should go talk to him. So Muhammad and Khadija uh, go to talk to her cousin. Um, and, you know, Muhammad tells him what happened, what he experienced. Uh, and Khadija's cousin says, you know, well, in the Bible, there are lots of stories like this. Um, in our sacred text in the Christian Bible, there are these people called prophets. And prophets are individuals who receive a message from God, um, and God wants them to speak that message to the community. So they, you know, they get the message from God, and then, then they tell it. And this, it kind of sounds like you might be a prophet. This might have been uh, a, an encounter with God or an angel, um, and you may be a prophet. Uh, and, you know, Muhammad is, um, he's, he's not quite sure about this. He's very hesitant uh, to accept this, um, but it keeps happening. He continues to have these encounters. He continues to have these, these experiences where this angelic being uh, appears to him um, and tells him things that he needs to recite, uh, gives him messages that he needs to give to the people. So he starts to come to an understanding that, yes, he is a prophet. Um, these are messages from God. Um, they're, they're funneled through the angel Gabriel. That's the, the angel who's later identified as the one who appears to Muhammad. Um, and that God is giving him these messages to speak to the community. Uh, so he does, he does speak these, uh, he tells these messages to his friends and family. Um, and he, you know, he, people are convinced. People believe that Muhammad is a true prophet of God and the messages that he's receiving are divine. Um, so these become the first Muslims. These become the first uh, group of, of individuals who follow Muhammad um, and, and see his role as a prophet um, and that he's receiving these messages from God. Um, so this, this movement starts to grow within Mecca. People are hearing about Muhammad, um, they're listening to his messages, and people are starting to, to follow him and, and to, to, you know, to follow this movement. Um, and he's, he's preaching a message of monotheism, right, that there is only one God. Um, and this is not a good thing to his tribe. So his tribe, the Quraysh tribe, is really not excited that Muhammad is doing this, um, that he is starting this new religious movement that's based on monotheism. So something else uh, to know about the, the cultural context or historical context um, is that the city of Mecca, or first I should say, um, the, uh, the tribal culture, right, there's all these tribes that are living in the Arabian Peninsula and they're nomadic and they move around throughout the peninsula. Um, there is a lot of violence. There's a lot of tribal warfare in this culture um, because they, this is a nomadic people who live in the desert and there's not a lot of resources in the desert. So there is, um, you know, there is infighting. There is fighting for control of these limited resources. Um, so that, that does happen in the, in the desert, in the peninsula. But the idea is that Mecca, or not the idea, but this actually is the way it was. Um, Mecca is a city of peace, and it's a city of trading. So all the tribes would come into Mecca, um, and when they came into Mecca, there were certain rules about how you conduct yourself within the city. Uh, you weren't allowed to bring any weapons into the city. You had to leave all weapons outside, um, and you couldn't engage in any sort of, of violence uh, or infighting between the tribal members once you're in there. Um, because Mecca really had to be a neutral place, a safe place, so that people could come in and, and they could do business. Um, if you are, you know, wandering around the desert, you're going to need to come at some point maybe to sell things that you've made or you've grown um, and, and to buy supplies that you need. Um, and all the tribes needed to have a place to do this. So it was sort of an agreed upon, um, you know, sort of treaty of, of neutrality and peace within the city of Mecca. Um, 
Another aspect of this part of Mecca is that there was this box. There was this very large box uh, within the city of Mecca that we already saw a picture of. So I'm going to switch back really quickly. There we go. Um, so we, this was our introduction slide, um, and we didn't talk about this image, um, but this picture here is of a large black box known as the Kaaba, or large black structure known as the Kaaba. Um, this is in the city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia. It's very large. Uh, the picture is not super clear here, um, but all those little white dots around it, those are people. Um, so you can see how large the structure is. The Kaaba is very important to Muslims, um, but it's important to know the Kaaba was already there when Muhammad was living. Um, so it doesn't start with Islam. And within Mecca, there was just sort of a general cultural memory, you could say, or cultural understanding that this box was something sacred. It was a special place. There wasn't, like, people, you know, had kind of forgotten exactly why it's sacred, um, exactly who built it or what the story was, um, but there was just sort of a memory that this was a special place, it was a sacred place. So another aspect of Muhammad's tribe, of the Quraysh tribe, um, is actually that the wealthy members of that tribe uh, were in control of the Kaaba. They managed the Kaaba. So another thing that the tribes would do is they would, they all had their, you know, their in individual gods, the uh, gods and goddesses that they would worship. And they usually had like little statues of those gods, little figurines or little statues of those gods that they would worship. Because the, uh, the climate in the desert was so violent and, and, you know, not stable, not secure, these tribes didn't want to keep these figurines with them. Um, it was too, uh, it was too risky. It was too dangerous to do that. So <clears throat> what they would do is they would store these statues um, in the Kaaba. Because there was this general understanding that it's a sacred place, um, it was a fitting purpose for that structure. So the Koresh tribe were in charge of this structure. So if you were a tribe, um, you would pay a fee to the Koresh tribe to store your, your idol, your your statue, your figurine of your god, in the Kaaba. Um, and then every time you came into Mecca uh, to, you know, to do your business, to do your trading, you would also come in to worship your gods um, because you knew that the statues of your gods were, were being stored in the Kaaba. Um, so you would go to the Kaaba and you would worship and you would pray there. So we'll go back, we'll go back to our other slide now. So you can understand um, that the Koresh tribe is not excited um, that Muhammad is teaching this message of monotheism. He is teaching people that there's only one God, right? There's no God but God. So anything else that people worship um, is a false God, is not really God. Uh, and people are joining this movement. They're turning away from these polytheistic religious traditions. This is really bad for the bottom line of the Koresh tribe, as well as lots of other Meccan authorities, because the economy of Mecca really depends on the polytheistic religions continuing um, so that people pay money to store their statues there, and then it keeps them coming back to the city of Mecca. Um, so they're, they're not happy. They're not excited with what Muhammad is doing, um, and much more so than not being excited. Um, they actively persecute Muhammad and his community. Um, so Muhammad and members of the community are attacked. They're beaten. Um, there are several attempts on Muhammad's life. They're trying to kill him. They're trying to put an end to this movement um, that's threatening their wealth and status within Mecca. Um, and it, it gets pretty bad. As I said, there were several attempts on Muhammad's life. There, people were trying to kill him. Um, so uh, in, six, uh, sorry, in 622 CE, um, Muhammad decides that they can't stay in Mecca anymore. It's too dangerous for them. So they move. They all leave. Everyone who is a part of this movement, a part of this, uh, this community, they leave and they go to another town called Medina. M-E-D-I-N-A. Um, it's, it's a little bit north uh, of Mecca, um, but they go there and they set up a community there. Um, this happens again at 622 CE, and this is the event of the Hijra. So this is the second bullet point here. 
the hydra, and hydra means like flight or emigration, um, is the moving of the community from Mecca to Medina. Um, this is really seen as sort of the official beginning of Islam. Um, you know, even though Muhammad has been receiving revelations for many years now, the movement has been growing. Um, the hydra is is really the start of the official start of Islam um, because this is when Muhammad sets up a community. He sets up a community um, where he is the leader and it's based around his revelations, um, a community that is trying to follow God uh, and, and to worship God together. Um, it's also year one in the Muslim calendar. So that's why it's, you know, in a way, sort of the official beginning of Islam. Um, many of the religious traditions that we've studied have their own calendars. Um, Judaism has their own calendar. It's year you know, like 4,000 something. Um, our Western calendar is based on the Christian calendar. It's year 2018. Um, and uh, and the, the Muslim calendar is based off of uh, starts in the year 622 CE, so it's year 14, this, this year is 1400 something. Um, so that's what the Hijra is. And as I mentioned, when they, you know, when they move, they set up a community, so they're living together. All the Muslims uh, are living together in community. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is an important aspect of the beginning of Islam because Muhammad goes from being just a religious and spiritual leader, he's receiving these revelations, um, he's speaking the revelations to the community, so in that sense he's a religious or spiritual teacher. Um, but when he sets up the community in Medina, now he's also a social and political leader, um, because he's the actual leader of that community. Um, so they're setting up rules and regulations and ways of life. You know, how do you order a community? How do you structure the society? Um, and that's a very important part of Islam because um, really the, the religious aspect and the social aspect are intricately intertwined. And, and they have been since the earliest stages uh, in Islam. Um, so th those two are combined when the Muslim community um, moves together to Medina. Um, so, uh, so Muhammad and his community, they remain in Medina for eight years. So from 622 CE to 630 CE. Um, that's when they return to Mecca. That's the next bullet point here. Um, but it's important to know that during that time, that eight year period, a couple things are happening. Um, Muhammad is continuing to see, receive re revelations from God. Um, and the movement continues to grow. Um, people are hearing about this community, they're hearing about this prophet, uh, and people come. People come to this town. Um, they move from all over the Arabian Peninsula to Medina to be a part of this new community. Um, so the, the community is getting larger, um, the movement is getting stronger and more powerful. At the same time, the, the Meccan authorities and the, the, the Quraysh tribe in Mecca they are not satisfied that Muhammad has left, right? It, they're, they're not saying, you know, oh, well, Muhammad's gone. He moved to a different town. You know, we can just let him and, and his people be now. Um, no, they really want to end this movement, this new religion, because it's growing so quickly that it is, it's, it's threatening their economic power. It continues to influence them um, and to, to drain money away from their interests in Mecca. Um, so they don't just let Muhammad and his community be. Um, they start to actively persecute them. Um, the Meccan army is going to Medina, attacking them, um, engaging them in battle, trying to stamp them out, trying to wipe them out. Um, so during this eight-year period, there is a lot of violence. There's a lot of warfare um, because the, the Medinan community is being attacked again and again and again. Um, so... This is important to know because um, with sort of the, you know, the, the political and social climate today, as Prothero talks about, there's a lot of assumptions and stereotypes about Islam. Um, as he said, you know, most Westerners, if you ask them the first thing they think of when they hear Islam, you know, they'll say terrorist and murderer and, and things like that. Um, and one of the reasons that people point to uh, is they say, you know, well, there's, there's a lot of warfare, there's a lot of bloodshed in the Quran. And there is. There are many passages that talk about warfare. Um, but it's important to know the context of those passages, 
those passages are referring to these eight years in which the Medinan community was continually attacked. Uh, they were under siege by the Meccan authorities um, who were trying to kill them all, who were trying to get rid of them. Um, so, uh, so the Medinan community, um, they did defend themselves. They did engage in that battle. So Muhammad becomes not just a religious leader, not just a social political leader, but also a military leader. Um, the Medinan community does not want to be killed, so they do defend themselves. So the fighting, do, it goes back and forth for eight years. Um, so there are a lot of passages in the Quran that talk about these years of warfare. Um, and there's a lot of passages in the Quran um, that talk about the rules of war. As Muhammad and his community engage in battle to defend themselves, um, Muhammad receives revelations from God about how to morally engage in war. Um, so there are a lot of rules about how to do that. Um, uh, some of these rules are that Muslims can never be the instigators of violence, so they can only engage in violence if it's to defend themselves or defend others who can't defend themselves. Um, they can never and um, they can only respond in kind uh, in terms of, you know, to the level of aggressiveness that they're attacked with. They can only respond with that same level. So they can't escalate a conflict. Um, they can't respond in a more harsh manner than they were attacked in the first place. Um, and uh, warfare should never include non-combatants. Um, so it should never include civilians, women, or children. Um, so there, there are these, these rules of engagement of war. Um, so that's, that's just kind of the context of those passages in the Quran. Um, so anyways, that, that lasts for eight years, as I said. And then in 630, um, Muhammad and his army return to Mecca. Um, they actually are coming back, preparing for a final battle. Um, they, they are coming into Mecca, um, thinking that they are going to fight uh, the Meccan army. And this will be sort of like a final battle. And they will put to rest the, this, you know, these years of violence. Um, but by that time, by 630 CE, the community in Medina, the Muslim community, has grown so large and so powerful that when they reach Mecca, um, the Meccan authorities surrender to him. Um, they, they give the city over to Muhammad. They say, we don't, you know, we don't want to fight you in battle because we know we're not going to win. So they surrender to Muhammad. Um, so Muhammad and his entire community then return to Mecca. Um, they, they sort of make Mecca their, uh, their capital city. They instate Islam as the official religion of Mecca, and uh, Islam spreads. Um, so Muhammad dies two years later. So he's only, um, you know, he's only in charge uh, of Mecca for about two years. Um, he dies just of, of natural uh, causes related to old age. Um, but within uh, within about a hundred years of his death, Islam has become an empire. Um, it spreads very, very rapidly throughout the world. Um, so from Mecca, from the Arabian Peninsula, um, it, spreads, it spreads into North Africa. Um, it sp spreads up through the Mediterranean. It spreads into Spain. Spain is Muslim for about 700 years. Um, it spreads throughout the Middle East and even as far east as India. Um, so it, it, you know, it gains a lot of followers. Um, and the last thing here is just that today there's about 1.7 billion Muslims in the world. So a little bit less than Christianity. There's about 2.2 billion Christians in the world. Um, but with this number, that means about 25% of the world's population is Muslim. Uh, and it is still the fastest growing religion in the world. Um, so most kind of um, predictions about what's going to happen to um, the global religious population. Um, most of the predictions say that probably by about 2050, uh, Islam will be uh, more popular than Christianity. There will be more Muslims in the world than there will be Christians um, because Islam is just growing much faster than Christianity is globally. Okay, so that's our historical overview, um, kind of some basics about uh, the origins of Islam as a religious tradition. And then next we're going to talk about the myths of origin, the stories related um, to the beginning of this tradition and the beginning of the world.